Hi everyone, Gareth here. Just to let you know that if you'd like to support the production of the Music Room podcast, you can. Just head to musicroompodcast.uk slash support or click the link in the show notes. Okay, on with the show. Welcome to the music. No, oh. oh, no, 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 no. Hello? I uh, do believe this is my show today, Gareth. So Ooh. if you could just uh, let yourself out of the door there. Thank you. Okay, Mike. That's it. Okay, all right. I will see you later. Over to you. Welcome to the music room. This time in the music room, yeah. what a treat as a composer. Yeah, really, perfect. really treating. Wow. Yeah. Toby, how about you? Uh, as is going to become apparent throughout this chat, uh, I am up to my cliches in panto land at the moment. Um, <laughs> no, no, you're not. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> Hello and welcome to The Music Room, the show where we chat to composers, songwriters and musicians about what they're up to before travelling back in time to see where it all started for them. Coming up in this episode, we have not one but two composers from the Music Room community, the fabulous Helen Lyon and Toby James. But first, those of you who are keen of ear will have noticed by now that I am not Gareth. My name is Mike Langley. I'm a composer and songwriter, filmmaker and photographer, and I'm also a long-standing member of the Music Room community. So who better to present a community episode than a community member? The Music Room is a place to meet fellow composers and musicians, be it full-time or just starting out, collaborate, socialise, learn, have a place to go for technical help, become inspired if you're struggling, and generally make this often solitary endeavour feel less lonely. I've made some great friends over the years, played on some utterly brilliant projects, had members play on projects of mine, took on challenges, had help when I needed it, and learnt an awful lot in the process. If you're not part of it already, come and find The Music Room on Facebook and join in. There will be links galore in the show notes. But before we chat to Helen and Toby, it's time for some music stories. The Music Room has had an upgrade, a refurbishment and an extension built. If you go to musicroom.community now, the link is in the show notes, you will find a new home for all things Music Room. This podcast will be there, the monthly roundup newsletter, and if you want to head further in there, there are benefits for paying subscribers too. Like there's a brand new free podcast, Music, 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 which is all about independent music discovery. Paid subscribers can access enhanced show notes with comments and voting for your favourite tracks. There's Listen, Watch, Read, a music media recommendation newsletter, and 2024 is going to see information and resources added that will help composers, songwriters and musicians, whether they're creating music for fun or seriously pursuing a career. Does that sound like you? Head to musicroom.community to take a look around and a free seven-day trial for the paid perks. The link is in the show notes. Also in music news, to toot my own little trumpet for a moment, my songwriting partner, the brilliant Lee Perry and I, have released our debut album, Senses, going under the pseudonym of LPM. It's available on all streaming platforms in the iTunes and Amazon store and can be found in its highest quality over on our Bandcamp page. We've also just launched a small video series of acoustic performances from the album called The Living Room Sessions, which have been an utter joy to make and are available over on our Instagram page and on our official YouTube channel. And finally, our first official music video to support the release of the album is out now for our track, Everything. Please check out the show notes for all the relevant links and feel free to listen, share, like and enjoy. (music) Helen is a violinist and composer writing for short film, documentary and library. Her first feature, Eva, won Best Sound Design at London Film Fest International 2023. Helen is a member of BAFTA Connect and has just commenced work on her latest feature documentary. Toby is a multi-instrumentalist composer, producer and musical director. Having enjoyed over 25 years as both performing and session musician, 
Toby is now concentrating on his own compositional journey, writing for TV, film and production libraries. Let's get into the music room and catch up with Helen and Toby. So, Helen Lyon and Toby James, welcome to the music room. So first, how on earth did you come to be a member of the music room community? Helen. Um, I got involved because of my very good friend Janet Overfield, uh, another fellow composer, and we'd met through Women in Film and TV and she'd said to me, you need to come along on a Thursday morning to a cuppa at nine o'clock. It's really lovely, really friendly. And I kept saying, yeah, yeah, I'll get there, I'll get there, and never had any time. And then eventually one morning actually got there and then I think I've only been to three or four, but then joined the Facebook group and joined the community. So, um, yeah, Janet is solely responsible for me, me joining. Janet is to blame for an awful lot of things that I got involved in. <laughs> <laughs> and she's absolutely wonderful. She How about wonderful. you, Toby? Yeah, very similar, really. Uh, an old sort of colleague of mine, uh, Jamie Salisbury, who's doing phenomenally well as a composer, uh, yeah. I quite early on in my composing for money career <laughs> I, uh, I I turned to Jamie for some advice and he said oh there's all these Facebook groups you should join and one of them is one of them is the music room and sort of signed up for the for the Facebook group and um, Gareth very kindly co- decided to call and we had a good chat and gave some invaluable advice and then yeah I try to make as many cuppers as I can. I've got a young family, so it's not always easy. But uh, yeah, just an invaluable yeah. group all around. Really. Fantastic. I feel exactly the same way. So, Helen, what are you working on at this moment in time? At this moment in time, um, I've got a brand new documentary that I've just been given. Maybe got that a couple of weeks ago, which is very exciting. And um, this will please a lot of composers. I've been brought on before the edit. so um, <gasps> The dream. <laughs> uh, so uh, it's quite a long project it's an indie really exciting project but the editing hasn't started yet so I've just had a meeting last week where I sent off the first kind of six demos and then I'm doing another six to t- six to ten um, to kind of have an album and she's cutting it to my soundtrack which is um, Ooh, amazing yeah. what a treat as a composer yeah really perfect. really treaty yeah. wow fantastic yeah. Toby, how about you? What are you working on at the moment? Well, uh, as is going to become apparent throughout this chat, uh, I am up to my cliches in panto land at the moment. Um, <laughs> oh, no, you're not. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> um, yes, so we just started yesterday. We had the first read through of uh, Jack and the Beanstalk at Grimsby Auditorium. Fantastic. Um, so, yes, I'm MD up here uh, in the throes of uh, trying to get a pantomime written before we open next week. <laughs> Wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I have some painful memories of Panto from many years ago, which I'm not going to go into here. <laughs> so let us travel back in time and discover your origin story like all superheroes. <laughs> so, Helen, we are now back in time. How yeah. did it all start for you? It all started um, when I think my mum asked me when I was five, do you want to have piano lessons? And I said, sure, I'll have piano lessons. Um, and then started learning the piano, went to choirs, probably with my sisters from about the age of eight, then learned violin. And then an extremely traditional classical route for me. So um, a lot of kind of very intensive violin, kind of sort of like two, three hours a day from quite a young age and then went to university and studied classical, like I did quite a classical degree. So my sort of journey into music was extremely traditional, really, um, peppered in with kind of other influences, which I'll talk about later. But um, yeah, that was my journey, definitely. Uh, Violin, piano, singing. Excellent. And how about you, Toby? Yeah, again, not to be boring, but very similar. I, um, (laughs) I, I think... Formerly, my my parents offered me piano lessons when I was seven, and I took them up and and sort of talked to it. My dad plays guitar, uh, and so there's always been kind of guitars around. So I think from a, a very young age, I've always at least strummed something. Uh, and I I vividly remember asking my dad to teach me how to play the Peter Gunn theme, which was one of the things that he played, <laughs> and him saying to me, "Well, <laughs> use your ear, just figure it out." And and that was the catalyst, I was thrown into this world of, oh God, I 
I mean, not that I can't read music. I've studied at music college uh, and again, classically, but I was thrown into this world of improvisation and using your ear. And so I've always gone kind of yeah. down a kind of a slightly more jazz route, a slightly more improvisational, literally composing on the spot kind of route. Uh, so yeah, just music, music through school, part of all the county music groups, music college, um, studied classical clarinet for most of music college, but but played quite a lot of sax in the big bands and the jazz gigs and whatever. So, yeah, that's amazing. A well gigged musician, yeah. then I'm assuming. And I would imagine the same for you, Helen. Lots of recitals and whatever yeah. throughout uni life. Yeah, definitely. Quite a lot of, well, I did just wedding gigs. Just that was the main way of making any money. So whilst whilst my friends were all in the pub, you know, behind the bar, I was um, off doing weddings at the weekend, which I say to my daughter now, who is 10 and learning the cello, get good because it's, it's a, a nice way to make money when you're a student. So, you know, it gets harder it as is. you get older. But, um <laughs> It was definitely my way of making a bit of a bit of cash just to support me at university. Um, yeah. I didn't do so much of the gigging stuff. I did that a little bit later. I had a, a tiny stint with a band and we did Chester Rocks, I think. Uh, a little bit of festival stuff, but I was definitely more... And I, I would sit at the piano. I was very kind of experimental at the piano and singing, but didn't really share that with people. I was always very sort of timid about kind of <laughs> singing to people. So definitely it was more of a um, behind-the-music way of playing. So that's that's definitely changed um, since I've yeah, been composing, yeah. what what yeah. point uh, what point in time did you sort of feel I uh, I think I want to be a composer here? Oh well, uh, so when did I want to be a composer? I probably wanted to be a composer when I was about sixteen. Yeah. I'd say about the age. I'm just thinking the Alicia Keys album. Don't know if anyone remembers this one. Yes, <laughs> that came out, and I remember being extremely kind of. I know it sounds a bit weird, but really sort of taken aback with that album because yeah. it was the first time I'd heard a piece of classical music being fused with with kind of pop and R and B. I'd never really heard that before, and I was playing that piece of music on the piano, so I sort of was suddenly a bit like, oh, there's a cool kind of crossover here. And I was always quite a sort of geeky musician. I, I mean, I still am, but I definitely didn't fit into the cool pop side at all. Yeah. So I'd, I, I struggled to see where I would fit in. So at 16, I was definitely thinking I'd love to write songs. I'd love to be a songwriter. Um, I didn't see how the traditional would, would fit in. I didn't see how my skills fitted in. That had never been made sort of visible to me at all. Even at university, I thought you had to be, if you wanted to be a composer and you'd gone to a classical university, you had to be a kind of like new music, art, kind of very important, arrogant kind of person. I didn't realise yeah. there was this whole other film side. So um, I went and I was a teacher instead oh. for a really long time. Yeah, so I didn't actually... Me officially, too. <laughs> yeah, we've all done it, right? So um, I didn't officially kind of put my, you know, flag flag in the ground or whatever till, um, till I was 30. Right. Yeah, that's when right. I decided I was going to do it, yeah. Oh, amazing. And and Toby, how about for you? How What was your transition into, yes, I think I'll be a composer? Yeah, I think professionally, I've really, I, I've only done this for the last year really um i mean i've i have all, i've always written and i've always arranged and i always thought that you had to be a pop star i thought you had to make an album and then it had to be you i didn't realize there was this thing called production music or film music or any of that um yeah so yeah so and it wasn't until last year that i think i was listening to the not to promote another podcast but i was listening to richard prins podcast the the trader music uh, guy and he took he said yeah. he said oh I've got an album of drones I've got 11 albums of drones <laughs> and I was like I play drones for Panto every year what you can't have an album <laughs> and that was the first album that got picked up and I was like my head just yeah. exploded and that was when I realized that I could do this kind of uh, as a job and that's what I wanted to do and you know um, but I have always written I remember Again, the catalyst for that being in the early 90s, there was a show on TV called The Paradise Club. And the music yes, was written yeah. by Stan Tracy. Do you remember it? And, uh, yeah, and yeah. the theme tune was this kind of fourth thing. And it was amazing. And uh, But the third time <laughs> that that came out, that that motif came out, it was played by saxes in, in five-part close harmony. Oh my God! And I just had—I had to know how that was done. Oh my God! It was amazing. Just that <laughs> sound, and I've been trying to recreate it ever since, and not going anywhere <laughs> close, of course. But but that was that was the moment where I thought, right, I've, 
I need to I need to write for something for an entity, and and I started writing for the school big band, and and I've always arranged and composed since then. But yeah, professionally, it was this time last year where I suddenly realised that actually all of this composing that I have been doing for the last twenty five years could be on someone's hard drive somewhere earning me money. So yes, not to be too absolutely. mercenary about it, but. You know. <laughs> It's, it's kind of like a similar way as to uh, how I got into it. It was like a money for old rope kind yeah. of thing. Just uh, hard drives full of music doing absolutely nothing. That's right. I, think a, uh, I, I, I produced quite a lot. I got quite into sort of dance music and, and funk and hip hop and house music. And I had quite a lot of friends in that world. Again, sort of around my 30s. And I thought that was it. I, I, so I started writing and, and giving it to DJs. And they play it in clubs and it go down great. But then what happens after that? Well, it, it lasts for a season and then you don't, you know, it sits yeah. on your hard drive, whereas actually it could be yeah. in a library somewhere. Mm. So, yeah, which is really kind yeah, of yeah. What I, where I'm at at the moment. I'm, I'm just, I'm churning out, not churning, but I'm, I'm releasing as many albums as possible. <laughs> churning doesn't sound you good, can does churn. it? Professionally making. That's right. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, professionally churning. Chur yes. yeah, <laughs> <laughs> so as as a little bit of a sidetracky thing, and I, I I find this quite an interesting thing to talk to. How do you how do you find the balance of being parents to young children and uh, being essentially a self employed composer as well? I know it's been extremely tricky at times. You could be partway through a take and there'll be a, he's hitting me <laughs> in the background or whatever. <laughs> and I mean, it's almost as difficult with cats, to be honest, because ours just shouts incessantly all day long. Uh, so, Helen, how do you find it? I, I, know, I think your kids are very similar ages to mine, in fact. Uh, yes, yeah, so mine are 10, 8 and 5. Yes, I've got um, a 10 and an 8 as well yeah <laughs> so for an example this morning because i needed to be slightly more organized my 10 year old decided she was a full-blown teenager and <laughs> there was no way she would move any faster than a than a, a glacier she just <laughs> was unable to function and i was sort of standing there thinking you are going to kill me in a minute if you don't get your shoes on oh i've not brushed my teeth yet well we've got two minutes till the bell well going and i've got my younger two standing there looking at me like you're clearly a bit stressed yeah i think for me actually on balance um, so my my route into composing i very much moved because of my children so it's a bit of a, a, a random one and i always say to people how inflexible teaching actually is. Secondary school, I was a head of music. Yeah. Totally inflexible. Um, for my situation as well, I needed to be at home. But I think, yeah, the recording thing, I mean, my husband just has to sort of, if it's a weekend, he just has to take them out of the house physically. Yeah. If it's a really important take, I'll just say, you've got to take them to the park. Do not come back for an hour. Just, just don't. Mm. Uh, but yeah, it, it's it's an interesting balance. Um, I, I actually really like it. Um, you know, I get six hours in the day, which isn't a huge amount of time, but they can go into after school club and things. The thing I really like about it is the fact they see me working. Um, and yes, that is yes, something yeah. that I hold really, really important. I never saw my parents job. I didn't really. And my mum mm. was a teacher. My dad worked with Americans. That was, you know, f with computers. I didn't really understand any more than that. My children... My studio is also the kind of music room. So my daughter does a cello in here. They do their piano in here. They see me working. I feel like as a woman as well, it's really important that they see this is mummy's space. This is where she works. This yep, is what she does. Absolutely. They can join in, contribute. You know, I've started recording my daughter. Um, so I absolutely love it. But of course, it, it definitely comes with its challenges. Yeah. You know, 100%. Yes. 100% yeah. I know, I know, Toby, you've got a very, very young. Yeah. My boy is um, two at the end of January. So he's very young now. I'm quite, uh, and, and I have a daughter as well from a previous relationship. So she lives with her mum, who she's nine today, in fact. Um, oh. My daughter, not her mum. <laughs> so, yeah, so so she's with me kind of every other weekend for a long weekend. So that that's very easy um, to block out. Going, just touching on something that Helen said, she doesn't really understand what I do because she doesn't see it which is a shame, which is a crying shame. Like explaining to her that I'm going to Grimsby for five weeks. It's just like, what are you talking about? Why? Mm. Whereas my son <laughs> is already, he wants to play the piano and he wants to, you know, he's, he's already figuring out that that's dad's studio and all this kind of stuff. 
Um, I'm quite fortunate in my home life because my son goes to work with my wife for two days a week, Mondays and Tuesdays. I'm just by myself at home uh, and I can get on. And actually, my wife has yoga on a Monday night. So they come home, I bathe him, she puts him to bed and then goes and does yoga. So I've got a really long stretch on a Monday that I can just get on. And yes, it, again, on a Friday, they tend to go out and do stuff, see friends, play groups, whatever. So uh, Monday, Tuesdays and Fridays are, are big kind of working days for me. Um, yeah. My biggest issue when they're home is less, and this is going to come up when she listens to this podcast, the, my problem is less my son <laughs> and more my wife, actually, <laughs> who is very, she likes to be entertained uh, so she'll quite often wonder. Just in, for uh, clarity, we uh, do not endorse Toby's uh, views of his wife. She'll, she'll quite often wander in and go, So what are you doing? You know, and it's one of those where it's like, Ah, get out. <laughs> so, and, and I love my wife implicitly and my son. But um, yeah, no, it can be difficult, especially if you're if you're not fortunate enough to have a, a place of work even at home if it's like an outbuilding or a, a shed or a you know a studio in the garden yeah. if you don't have that and it's a room in the house it it can be very tricky my other problem is that if it's so, if it's my boy's nap time his bedroom is literally above my studio mm. which was not well thought out <laughs> but it's just the way the rooms go so you know there's no <laughs> recordings done for that two hours um yeah so, but yeah, no, I, it, it kind of works. This I can take Wednesdays and Thursdays and it's just me and my son and we have a great time and, mm. you know, I don't really need to think about it. I can do some mixing on cans when he's down for a nap or whatever. Um, yeah. But And again, he, he knows that that's where daddy works and he's sort of starting to go, oh, I want to go, I want to go and sing songs or I want to play the piano or, you know, it, it's just great that he, yeah, he's, yeah. it's visible, as you say. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I found increasingly time is the most valuable commodity in mm -hmm. my yeah. life completely. Yeah. And it's, uh, how do you find, uh, it's almost like a forced inspiration thing because you know you've got this block of time to complete something. How do you cope with those kind of limitations, Helen? I think, yeah, that that is the thing I struggle with the most, definitely. Um, I actually said to my husband last night, I've got to get going on these new demos and I'm, I can feel my resistance to it just because <laughs> you have to particularly when you've got a project this project that I'm working on is really um the the subject matter is really quite intense um and so you've kind of got to this sounds really like arty but you have to kind of really get in the zone yeah. um in order to know what what you're creating and I can feel a bit of trepidation just because I'm thinking I'm not sure my headspace is there today so I've actually kind of had to put it in my calendar. Like I'm also applying for some arts funding. So yesterday was my arts funding day. And then I know I've got three days to do my documentary work so that I know I've got to do it in those three days because otherwise I will just procrastinate. I'm, I'm the kind of person that will just go, oh, I'll just Google this YouTube video about how to use my new software that I bought. Um, <laughs> yeah. Because that is the kind of person I am. Um, I think the thing about being at home, it's also, oh, I'll just put the washing on and I'll just order yes. some Christmas presents and I'll just do this and I'll just do that. Yeah, yeah. My, my husband's job is very much nine to five, very rigid, quite often in the office, um, not at all creative, really. Um, and it's also, I feel I'm default carer, so I'm default mum, default kids are sick, default, you know, be off. And that's not his responsibility. It's just that that's kind of the way it happens when you're freelance. So I think it yes, happens course, to men yeah. and women. Yeah. So I find the kind of I'm learning now. Now I've got three in school and I'd say, Toby, it makes a massive difference once you get them all in school yeah. because generally you get your reliable five days a week, six hours block. You pretty much know what you're doing. And I'm trying to not work weekends. That's the other thing. Yeah. And I think not working weekends and having the week free, my inspiration has been better because I know I've got a mental break. So, um, yeah, I, I really don't like the you must right now thing. I find that really hard. Um, yeah. And I haven't found a way around it other than just not letting myself leave until I've got something down. Yeah, so, I mean, I was going to ask you, do you have any techniques to put yourself like into an inspirational zone for whatever you happen to be working on? Yeah, so 
for this stock, it's as acoustic as possible, basically. So I bought myself a rain stick, um, which um, I was very excited about. It's taller <laughs> than my son. It's massive. It's about four <laughs> foot. Um, got it for five quid on Facebook. Where do you so, put the mic? <laughs> well, you know, just in front of it. Um, it actually was a bit of a workout trying to record it because it was like full arms out and rolling. Yeah, very, very complicated. <laughs> Um, so what I tend to do is I'll give myself a recording day. So I'll say this is an experimenting recording day. Get everything out. Get the old flute and the dodgy saxophone and the accordion and everything else. Get it all out. Record it. See what you get. <clears throat> Maybe do a day of that and then get five or six bits of like just ideas out yep. and then go back to that then. And then I've got something to work with to kind of make myself a bit of a sample mm -hmm. library or get some bits and bobs that I kind of want to do. Um, because then there's no pressure that I've got to create something finished because my pressure is always get it finished. Yes, so yeah. for me, it's like, well, just get some sounds out and then I find once I've got my inspiration, then I write quite easily. So that's been my technique for this. For library, I find it easier because it's very formulaic. Um, so if I'm doing like a bed's tense score, the first two or three tracks, I tend to manage. It's when you need to do tracks four, five, six, seven, eight. <laughs> yeah, <I>. yep. <laughs> Start to struggle a little bit. It's all uh, absolute gold until you hit track three. <laughs> track three, yeah, absolutely. Um, <laughs> so that's my that's my my way round is Super. to try and make music. Yeah, 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 yeah. How about you, yeah. Toby? I'm a big fan of deadlines. I'm a big fan of. I I, I read. I have a couple of sort of <laughs> side hustles, really. Um, so I'm and I'm big into the all the kind of the business books and the. You know, systemization and franchise models and all that kind of stuff. And I'm sort, of, I'm really trying hard to apply that to what I do as a composer. So, and at the moment, or most of what I do is library music anyway, which, as you say, can be quite formulaic. But it's about standardising those things. So, you know, if the if the production label calls up and says, right, we need a Motown album, okay. I, it's a it's a template in Logic that's just Motown instruments you know, sorted out the EQ or all that kind of stuff. So it sounds Motown. You can't help but sound Motown. And then it's just you're on a strict diet of Motown music outside of work all the time. So as soon as you sit Ooh. down, there's absolutely no way I'm going to start playing bebop because all I can hear in my head <laughs> is Motown, you know. Mm. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and as you say, you know, the first kind of five tracks are okay. And then you have to, you have to go back and... And just analyze. I, I, I'm another. I'm a big fan of analyzing stuff. And again, it's a music college thing, I suppose, or a, a university thing. But just mm -hmm. literally breaking down bar by bar. I always have a little notebook with me that's got, you know, this happens in bar twelve, and this happens in bar three, and this snare doesn't come in, and it's doubled with the claps, and you know, and and I've almost got the logic, you know, the screen that looks like Lego. I've almost got that done and labelled up so that then it's just a question of, you know, it's just paint by numbers. Yeah. And then... He, it's that easy. It is. It's dead <laughs> simple, you know. It's dead simple. But, and also, you know, if you've got someone in America going, we need this by tomorrow, you know, you just, just do it. And I think not that the quality is bad, but there's a perfectionism thing that has to, nest, you know, you have to bend a little bit. Different people hear different things. That snare sound might not be right for you, but it might be right for them, so... You know, if you do yeah. have to work quickly, it's not one of the things about, well, it's in, in the motivation world is that inspiration is a feeling, whereas action, you know, is a thing. You get, you, you've got to turn up, you've got to be disciplined, you've got to just write. It doesn't matter what it mm. is. It's just the act of writing and out of that something good will come yeah. rather than going, oh, my muse, oh. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just, just, just write something. You know, I needed a ballet for a big scene to uh, yesterday for a big scene for the the beanstalk growing, and we needed a ballet. And ten minutes. Oh no, you didn't. And ten minutes later, shut up. Sorry. And ten minutes later, <laughs> <laughs> ten minutes later, they had a ballet. You know, because it needed to be done. Yeah. So, you just think along. It's, those it's a brilliant exactly skill set right. to have. Yeah, it I, is. Yeah, it doesn't always work. Being able to dive in there. Yeah, it doesn't always work, but it has to work. No. If that makes sense. Yeah. Mm, absolutely. So, we at the Music Room like our guests to leave an item and a piece of advice. Helen, what would be your item? 
Oh, so the item might not be very helpful for everybody, um, hmm. but it's my it's my violin. But there's a theme, there's a kind of thought here that it's basically my instrument. So I <clears throat> didn't learn until maybe two years ago that it was probably my biggest strength. I think I was busy trying to be other people in the kind of, you know, I don't really hear what I'm going to do with this. But then when I started to to use it rather than sort of burying my head in what I should be doing, um, it, it's really, really transformed the way I, I write. So I think I would say to people, use what feels familiar to you if you're if you're writing. Um, I can't easily whip up some Motown because it's just not in my skill set. Mm. But I do have, I think it's listening to what you've learned through the kind of like 33 years of playing a musical instrument. You know, I've, I've picked up a lot and actually it's just the physical item would be what is familiar and then you can do a lot with that. Toby. How about you? Um, it's an item to leave. It's the notebook. I'm a I'm a big fan of notebooks um, for for journaling, <laughs> for writing stuff down, for just everything. I've got notebooks galore, um, and I'd like to think that yep. it's my my uh, a little bit my mum's influence on me. Who she wasn't musical in any way. We had this joke that she was even bad at the maracas, um, but what she did love was <laughs> she loved a notebook. Um, and and she used to call a pencil. She used to call it a thinker. I need a thinker, Tobes. Come on. Um, <laughs> and it and it just for me, you can't have a digital version of this. It doesn't work. I need it out on the desk as I'm working, in the in, maybe not in the car, but I need it with me at all times. You know. So if, <laughs> if you get a moment where you go, oh god, yeah. I really like that. What's the name of that? Jot it down. Oh, what that was eight bars there that I really like. You know, everything goes in the notebook, and you come back to it later with a highlighter and you. You know, you figure stuff out from there, but it's definitely get a notebook. It doesn't have to be fancy. I make my own. You know, they're not good, but they're, it's just a tool, isn't it? Just get on with it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. That's always my thing about AI and the argument I always say. I know I don't want to talk too much about AI, but um, I don't. I, I think that's the the thing we have as humans is we have the capacity to use a notebook and to jot and revisit. And I yeah. have about eight notebooks, and I, I'm exactly the same. Yeah have to have it with me all the time i put absolutely everything in it um and people you know laugh and say what are you doing with that notebook but it's got and i also have work ones and home ones i don't believe the two they, they cannot cross over i've got to have a work notebook but um i, I think it's that capacity where we're able to make little, little connections in our yeah. in our brains and then make a little note and come back to it and i i don't see how that can ever be replicated i think the notebook is such a like I, like you say i can't put it in a in a notes, even on my phone, it just doesn't. Yeah, it just oh, no. doesn't read in the same way. Yeah, yeah. Something about yeah. putting pen to paper, isn't it? I always yeah. find it's just not fast enough. No, it's not fast I enough. I just no. need That's to right. like well. <laughs> and there's something no. about your own handwriting as well. It, it sort of it refreshes yeah. that memory, doesn't it? Of of, yeah. of whatever yeah. you've been writing down. I actually just to touch very quickly. I, you're saying about splitting notebooks up, and I agree wholeheartedly. I think you know I've got a journal and I've got a daily journal, and then I've got my work notebook and I've got this stuff. But then. In much the same way that we all have a man drawer where everything gets chucked in, I have a, I have a, <laughs> a dirty notebook where I just, if I, it's the only thing I can find at the time and I need to get something down. And then I go back and sort it all out and, and it disseminates into wherever it should be. But we've all got that man drawer. Uh -huh. We've all got that place where there's a, you know, there's half a book of stamps and there's an old cassette case and there's, you know, a screwdriver and some screws that you took off something that you don't know anymore, you know. Well, I think I've got about 400 of those <laughs> around the house. <laughs> I think my whole house is one of those drawers. Yeah. I think that's just my house. <laughs> I, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, Helen, finally, a piece of advice. Oh, so my advice would be, as, uh, I'm not just saying this because of this podcast, but it would be to have a community. So um, the most important thing I did was... Um, make friends with other composers. Um, yeah. Had a very interesting conversation with a director or a writer or somebody who said, oh God, there's loads of composers here. That must be hell for you. And I was like, what are you talking about? It's brilliant. Where are they? Show me them. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and I, I love nothing more than networking and just chatting to other composers. It's my favourite yeah. thing to do. I know it's not what we should do, but um, I've probably made the most progress in my career through talking to other composers because they tell me things that I didn't know about. Um, I think we always share at yes. all our yeah, advice yeah. I've even recommended other people that when I'm kind of pitching for a job which is I've only done it once I realised I was doing it and was like oh damn um, <laughs> but I, I really think having a community either on Facebook like a virtual community um, WhatsApp groups whatever it is 
having support to ask the, the questions that you think are stupid, but you realise the person you're asking doesn't know, or they do know, and they're very happy to give you that information. Um, that absolutely transformed how I feel about working from home on my own all the time. Yeah. Because I know I've got 15 or 20 people I could message and say, could you just help with this? I'd, mm. I'd say I've got about that now. When I first started... I had nobody I could ask, literally nobody. So I didn't have any kind of safety net. And it was actually another composer, um, Roma, um, who's a fabulous, phenomenal composer um, living in the Northeast. And I was on a Teams kind of meeting with her and she just sent me an email afterwards and said, just listening to what you were saying, have you thought about checking out these people? And so now I try and do that to other people because people don't always ask. So I try and now message people and say, I noticed your question, just thought I'd point you in the direction of this group or that group um so yeah get yourself a community Mm. it's the safest thing and also the best for your mental health as well because it can be quite difficult being on your own all the time yeah absolutely yeah really important and and toby yeah what uh, that was great advice i thought of hundreds of other pieces of advice as soon as you said that and thought oh damn um i guess my advice (laughs) would be just get on with it you know whatever it is that you're waiting to do don't wait start don't research start just make some kind of music today right now turn this off in a minute and then uh, and then <laughs> then go and write some music because you know yeah. i think we have a tendency the internet has convinced us all that we don't know how to do it and we do there's a place for research and there's a place for oh i'm not sure how to eq this or how should i voice those saxes or what should i do there's a place for that sure but go and do go and make the mistakes go and reiterate go and just get on with it because it's that whole paralysis by analysis thing. If you read so much and so many forums and listen to all the advice, and it's bound to be conflicting advice as well, and you can mm-hmm. never make your mind up because you're terrified of doing something wrong, and you're terrified of joining a team, and, oh, God, if I, I can't be friends with them if I do it this way. You, you know, forget it. Just <laughs> turn it off. Turn your phone off. To switch the internet off if you can. Just go and write some music and have fun with it. You know, because otherwise it's going to be, you're going to turn into a jaded hack like the rest of us. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic yeah. advice from the both of you. <laughs> That's brilliant. Well, look, it's been an absolute joy chatting to you both this morning. It's been wonderful. And uh, thanks for joining us in the music room. Thanks, guys. Helen, Lion and Toby James. Thanks Thank for having you. me. Thanks for listening to the Music Room podcast today. If you'd like to know more about the show or the community that surrounds it, head to musicroom.community. The link is in the show notes.